Good morning and welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York and our virtual worship series. This video is for Sunday, March 7th, which is the third Sunday in Lent. We hope you're staying safe and healthy wherever you are. We're glad that you tuned in this morning and we're thankful that we can provide you this little video. And uh, just a reminder, if you want to see the full worship service with all the music and the beautiful worship space, just tune into this website and uh, you'll find the link right on the home page. So glad you're here. In the meantime, let's frame our hearts and minds before God for a moment before we get ready to worship. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and to act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> and the Holy Gospel for today is according to St. John in the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today's uh, gospel incident, <laughs> or as I like to often call it, Jesus' temple tantrum, it's it's fascinating, not because of the way it happens, but to me because John's account is so different from the other Gospels in some very significant ways. Like, first of all, John places this incident at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry instead of at the very end. And the other Gospels indicate that this temple event was the moment when the leaders decided that they had to get rid of Jesus once and for all. This was like the pivotal event. But for John, it seems as though the raising of Lazarus is what turned out to be the last straw event for the religious leaders to commit to killing Jesus. So um, that's very, very different. It's a little weird to think of Jesus in Jerusalem at the very start of his ministry, because we're used to hearing about it only on Palm Sunday. But John, here in chapter 2, um, wastes no time in defining for us the essential problem and the solution that Jesus brings. And the problem seems to have something to do, well, with the temple. After all, he does say, destroy it, that'll be the sign. Hmm. Is he saying that the church is unnecessary? And if it is unnecessary, then where in the world is God? <laughs> well, there's a key word in Jesus' accusation. Um, in John's Gospel, again, it's different from the other Gospels. And, and this, is, this is really interesting, because where they say the temple has been turned into, where they say that Jesus says the temple's been turned into a den of thieves, right? John quotes Jesus as saying, You've turned the temple into a marketplace. Marketplace is very different from den of thieves, no? Maybe, actually, and, and you may think it sounds softer than a den of thieves, but actually it might even be more incriminating. 
because a marketplace isn't, you know, by nature immoral or evil or even corrupt. In fact, the marketplace is essential for the sustenance of know, any establishment that, that requires money and people to survive. And that obviously includes the church. I remember, too, that Jesus never really condemned um, private enterprise, um, you know, because Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. So the problem here is really at the root that it was beginning to be difficult to figure out which was which. The temple and the marketplace had merged. They had become the same thing. So when Jesus says, go ahead, tear it down, you know, that'll be my sign. He says in a way, hey, it's not necessary anyway, because I'm the presence of God, not this building. Okay, but, but the paradigm shift that Jesus is calling for in this moment, it actually comes up again in John's gospel later on. It might even be clearer when it comes up the second time. When Jesus has the conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well, you may remember she asks Jesus, where should the people go to find God? Should they go to Mount Gerizim, the Samaritan temple, or should they go to Jerusalem's temple? And Jesus says, you know what? God is neither here nor there. Where is God? Well, God may not be where you think God always is. But you know, the problem isn't even so much the question of where is God? The problem is that the people in Jerusalem had stopped looking. The amalgamation of the temple and the marketplace had desensitized them to all of this. Because listen, all the religious leaders can say to Jesus is, look, we've spent 46 years building this thing. You're going to raise it up in three days? That's preposterous. See, they're so stuck on the building, you know, that everything else is, as, as Paul says in the second reading for today, foolishness. And by the way, even the disciples didn't understand this reference, our text notes, until after the resurrection. <clears throat> Do we? You know, all they remembered was, zeal for my father's house will consume me. They didn't remember the three days and the whole metaphor that Jesus was creating. So really, do we get it? You know, Luther was keenly aware of how easy it is to lapse into worshiping uh, the wrong gods, like relics or politics or control or power or money or even tradition or the cathedral that Rome was building at, in Luther's day. Luther had always said, you know, a lot of things become gods to us when we consider them to be more important than our Lord. And God is, you know, Jesus is saying in today's gospel, um, we ought to stop worshiping things that provide us personal gain and instead focus on the real church, which is, as he was trying to indicate, a person, not a place. You know, think about it. Later on, Jesus says to Peter, Upon this rock, I will build my church. When he said this rock, he's pointing to Peter. Not the slab at 55 Wilbur Boulevard, but the church is built on the foundation of the faith of a person, of Peter, and of Christ. So Luther said, yeah, the church should be God alone. It should be Christ alone. So when you look at that, and you listen to the response to, to, to Jesus on that day, what are the brick and mortar things that are in your life? What things have you worked on for 46 years, you know, and built that keep you grounded and sure and safe and secure? And then, well, because it's Lent, don't be afraid to ask yourself, are any of those things that you've built things that have become the end instead of the means? You know, like your routines, your traditions, your habits, um, 
your house, your opinions, your knowledge? What is your real foundation? You know, Jesus wants us, especially during this Lenten shedding process, to break down some of those walls we've built between us and God, between us and our neighbor, some of those walls of, of closed-mindedness that we've built for 46 years, you know? He wants us to abandon some of the practices that have amalgamated our world and our spirituality in order to stop the desensitization process, in order to rediscover the joy of, 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 of reclaiming the essential source of our soul and our salvation. So, what are you willing to risk dismantling in the next 26 days of Lent? On the outside chance that Jesus could replace it all in three. Well, he could, and he will. But you know, he won't replace it with more stuff. He's going to replace it with something even more valuable. He's going to replace it with himself. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, may the peace of God be with you always. Take a moment to share that peace with the people that are with you in the room. Make a call, send a text to somebody you wouldn't ordinarily communicate with. And let them know that the Spirit of God is filling their lives with himself right now. And now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray boldly as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. And remember, you are the body of Christ raised up for the world. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we hope to see you either in person or on video next week. God bless you all.